gun club stuff. Because, um, I just saw a gun club the other night. In New York? Uh -huh. Where else? This is Chip Graining from Scarce, formerly from Anastasia Screamed. And we thought as a nice end of the year treat, we would do an interview with him here on. Geez, which show is it now, anyway? Uh, hmm. Merry Christmas? Wait, let me see now, the 30th. One, two, th oh man, it's gonna be hard. Two, nine, 16, 23, 30. Well, this must be Cafe Cabaret. Well, tune in to Noise Party on January 4th and you get to see this man's band, Scarce, performing at TT the Bears in honor of Billy Williams' birthday, among other things. But right now, Chick, is it graining? Graining. Graining, okay. Because Billy spelled it graining. Everyone does. Yeah. Or oh. granin. Grenwing. <laughs> Grenwing's my favorite. Did you get this all through school, too? Yeah. Grenwing's from school, but I never forgot it. Grenwing. Grenwing. It sounds like a, a term, an Arctic term, a certain type, like the brown ones or something. Did you ever get the bullies who would, like, uh, as they were beating you, they would like make fun of your name too. No, no, you're lucky. Because you know, I used to get Francis. That's a girl's name. Or Francis, like Saint Francis. Boom, 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 boom. Sometimes it was Saint girls. Saint Francis. Yeah, would be <laughs> girls that would do this, you know. And it's like, because you know, Catholic town and stuff. But you grew up in Knoxville. Mm -hmm. Probably considerably different from where I grew up, which yeah. was Pittsburgh. But. Uh, yeah. Maybe you could tell me a little bit about Knoxville. Different, I'd, the same. I'd, I'd love for you to spin some stories about your 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 existence down there. Uh, let's see. Well, like starting where? Oh, the, I don't know. The, the church groups, maybe? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. That sounds pretty good. You yeah. were born in, like, what, 1959 or something? That's when, no, 66. Wow. 1959. Mm. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that. Hmm. Because I was born in 57. Must I be just, looking pretty good today. No, no, I, th I just thought of you as more like my age, and I guess I was wrong. Well, they say that uh, people born in 66 are on the very, very edge of the baby boom. There's like four different segments to the baby boom, and you're at the tail end of the last segment. On the Chinese calendar, it's a fire horse year. Fire horse? Mm -hmm. What's that? That means a horse times ten, whatever a horse is. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Like, next time I go to a Chinese restaurant, I'm going to look at the horse and see what that is. Yeah, I don't, it doesn't say it. it. You have to get one of the books, and then oh, okay. 1966 Fire Horse, every 160 years. Wow, like that. what does that signify? Um, whatever the horse's traits are, I forgot what they were. Mm, um, it, patience. Look it up. Um, okay. That thing's trying to steal my soul. Uh-oh. Mm. Well... Oh, what a blow that phantom gave me. We're going to have to get Edwin Carpenter in here. He wrote a book called Oh, What a Blow That Phantom Gave Me. And wow. it, it's about natives in New Zealand who think the camera is going to steal their soul and just things like that. The effects of media on Aborigines and whatnot. I could actually see it stealing people's souls. I can imagine that. Not in the way that, not in a literal way, but I can see it eventually happening. Well, get too many pieces of you, you know. That, well, you know, now with those yeah, holograms right. and stuff, you know, yeah. you know, I might be able to make this into an animatronic in the year 2023 or something. Wow, that'd be nice. So you were born in 66, and so, uh, geez, I guess uh, that would mean that you were 13 years old in 1979, mm -hmm. that year of malaise. Mm -hmm. and. Well, that must have been something. Well, I remember being 16 during the Watergate hearings. Mm -hmm. I remember missing cartoons because of the Watergate hearings. <laughs> that must have been a bitch. I used to miss cartoons because of the moon launch, because of the astronauts. Oh, know? yeah. So yeah. The astronauts couldn't compare. No. With bugs. Yeah. Right. We're just shooting, shooting apes up into space. Mm -hmm. Whose idea was this, anyway? You know, <laughs> You put it that way. Well, not only the astronauts were apes, but you know they should have started small with insects, worked their way up to phylogenetic skill. 
So they got to, uh, they, they did, I guess. They started with dogs, they got chimps, and they got uh, John Glenn. Yeah, so, that's yeah. true, yeah. Were there any pigs? Pigs in space. I'll bet you there were. It sounds familiar. Oh, well, yeah, that, it was the Muppets thing. <laughs> 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 but I was wondering if maybe it was that was inspired by actual pigs in space. It's amazing <laughs> how much the products of imagination are inspired by real life occurrences, weird phenomena and stuff. Yeah. Some marketing genius decides, hey, the Care Bears, you know, they, they see some, so you see some obese park bear digging in a dumpster and they say, hey, the Care Bears. I think they were looking at deadheads. Hmm. That could be too, yeah. An obese deadhead digging in a dumpster, maybe. Right. Hey, hey, put back those deposit bottles, you bearded rascal. Yeah. Hey, he looks like a bear. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, would it be fair to say that the hippie thing sort of passed you right by, or...? It passed me by, and then that second part was a little after me. But I was also too young for hardcore, at least, as I saw it. You know what I mean? Yeah. That first thing, and then once that's gone, what, what, hmm, you want to do that? Mm, not really, you know. It's kind of an in-between thing. Anyone who's 27 now would probably know what I'm talking about. It's, so it was a real in-between kind of thing. A cuspier. Yeah. Yeah. So sort of like thirty six actually. Really? Uh, too what? too old to be a, too young to be a hippie, too old to be a punk. Mm -hmm. All that's left to do is sit around and get drunk. Mm. But uh be backwards for me. Yeah, I guess. Too too young to be a punk, too old to be a hippie, all there is to do is sit around and get uh, drunk. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Church groups. In Knoxville. Yeah. yeah, there was, you know, like in in school, I don't know, I didn't have anything to do in my early years in school. Sundays I'd go to this church group. And one time they asked this, they asked everyone to close their eyes and imagine someone in the room who needed everyone's help. Someone, the person who was most disturbed, the, the person who was in danger, the person that you felt most for. Imagine that person as Jesus. <laughs> And everyone started laughing and opened my, my eyes, and they were all looking at me. I was like, oh. <laughs> that was like one of those reality moments. But you know, I don't know, it's kind of weird. I was in my high school cafeteria, and there was this guy who was like a, mid, a dwarf or something, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I used to eat really fast because we only had like 20 minutes, and I was like wolfing my food down, and everybody started laughing. And I thought they were laughing at this dwarf. I turn around and the dwarf's pointing at me eating. Everybody's <laughs> laughing at me. <laughs> the laughing dwarf. Yes. Oh. Yes. Wow. Oh, so. That sounds more like a dream. Yeah, I know. I know, but it's true. Wow. Well, you should hear some of the dreams. Like, uh, I have this gold Volkswagen and this guy I'm in business with paints it brown so that his giant pet parrot will pick it up thinking it's a nut and drop it to the ground, smashing it with me inside of it so he could own the whole business himself. <laughs> and I told this to my girlfriend and she said, you think I'm trying to hold you back, don't you? <laughs> wow. I have yeah, a friend who dreamt of the lamprey nannies and a thousand deviled eggs on a tray. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. I just like the concept of lamprey nannies. Wow. Yeah, well, for those of us out there who don't know what a lamprey is, it's this fish that attaches itself in a sucking motion to larger fish and, and drains them of their blood and vital fluids until yeah. they're nothing but a hollow husk. Sort of like New York City, <laughs> you know, in a way. Giant lamprey. Yeah. I mean, it's like anywhere in a way. Well, now, we we got to get back to Knoxville. Okay. I mean, there's no such thing as got to, but... uh. Maybe you could give me some impressions of some other cities, just to give us perspective, like like your opinions of other well, parts of the country. Well, Knoxville, I didn't really finish illustrating it. The, the people there, um, two-thirds of my high school class, these were the same people in the church group and why they thought I needed help, went on to become accountants. It was a class with a lot of personality, two-thirds, really. That's what they were all going to do. Well, that's a good solid business. And where did the other third become? Insurance agents? Uh, don't know what happened to them. 
I haven't actually seen anyone that I graduated with. Maybe, well, two or three people, literally, since that day. Really? Yeah. So you sort of slowly turned and walked away? No, yeah, not slowly. <laughs> it's, it's pretty quick. Yeah, it's, it's well, how old were you when this happened? Oh, that thing? Yeah. Oh, like, I don't know, 13 or something. Wow. 1979. Wow. I was listening to Cheap Trick at Budokan. Live in yellow. <laughs> I loved yellow. So I didn't like him much in '79, but you know, I still I heard a song from Face the Music the other day, and I wish I had that album because mm -hmm. I really liked that record, and I liked El Dorado too. After that, it's sort of it's sort of a fall off. You know, they plateaued, mm -hmm. just like Jethro Tull, you know. Yeah, Tull. I never the st I never got into Tull. I really didn't. See, that's just it. In '73, I guess I was 16. We had Tull, Uriah Heep. I mean, man. What an impoverished childhood, you know? Yeah. I went yeah. to see Uriah Heep. And, uh. Yeah, I got sick at a Rush concert because of the drum solo. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I wasn't, wasn't messed up, nothing. Just there he was playing this pompous drum solo <laughs> and I threw up. Over anybody? Um, no. It wasn't crowded. When did you leave Knoxville? Hmm. 86. Now you were with some band. Um, are they still around? The Knoxville band? Yeah. Um, no. No? No. Because last time I talked to you, they One were. got his teeth fixed and married a nurse, and one went back to Memphis, and I don't know what happened to the other one. Oh, okay. How about the Blue Jean band? Ever seen any of your old compadres in that? No. That was from the sixth grade, as Francis was going to tell you. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh-uh. I haven't been back to Knoxville in a while. What would you do? What's the first thing? Where's the first place you'd go? Or the first thing you'd do if you did go back? Mm, go to the Long Branch. The Long Branch? Mm -hmm. What's that? It's a bar. Yeah? What kind of bar? Um, um, it's a homie bar. It's like, uh, hmm. It's just, well, it was there forever as this biker bar. They tore it down, put a bank up, and moved it across the street into a florist. But it still has the same feel. As soon as the wood gets all shiny from people walking on it, leaning on it, falling on it, then, then it'll be back to where it was. As soon as it smells really bad. It's still a cool place. Hell, I don't even know if it, that's still there, though. Yeah, 86. Yeah. It's, it's a bit of a while. Yeah. Well, what kind of place was Knoxville exactly? It's now it's in the middle of the state. It's um in the eastern part. Well, it's a there's it's a huge college town. Um, it's a fairly southern Christian would be a good way of describing it. It's um it's comfortable enough to where um, complacency is available. And you know, it's, you don't really want to do something there. You might want to end up there when you're older. And there are a lot of young people, but they're all acting like older people. At least they were. I don't know what's going on there now. It could be great. Um, Chris Whittle. Hmm? Chris Whittle. Oh, yeah. 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 Television's in the classroom. I had a friend who worked for him. Mm -hmm. Couldn't stand it. Quit. I worked for 1330 before it became Little Communications. What was that like? Um, I was working on an assembly line with all the rest of the wastrels. And um, we were packing like little toothbrushes and little toothpastes. It was a welcome to college kit. <laughs> packing a kit for all the people that we would never meet because we weren't going to go to college. So Just, this is like the 83 or something? Mm, 84, 85. 84, 85. Well, if you don't mind my asking, how much did that job pay an hour? Like maybe four, three fifty or four. Uh, can you live on that in Knoxville back then? Sort of. Yeah. What are the rents? What were the rents like? I mean, hundred twenty dollars for a nice four room. No. Mm. For that would be a two room, a functional two room, nice four room. Two hundred dollars. That's not too bad. Yeah. I can't even remember much in Knoxville, you know? 
it's 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 hard for me to even remember stuff about it. It's just kind of gone. You know what I mean? It's just kind of. It's not you know what I consider home. Or when I go there, I go to Knoxville. I don't really go home. So. I don't know. It's just non. It's not. There's nothing that special about it, except for the mountains. What are the mountains called? Smoky. Smoky mountains. Yeah. See, I should know that, but I don't. So, what other towns do you like to, uh, you know, think about? What towns do I like to think about? Hmm. I like to think about townless places in New Mexico. If you actually want to, if you're thinking of a place that I actually do think about, it's New Mexico. <laughs> I think it's pretty there. You'd like to retire there? Hmm, maybe. I hadn't actually thought about that. Well, where are you living now? I live in Providence. Gee, you know, that's funny because I sort of half, halfway live there myself now. Yeah. Providence, Rhode Island. You ever do any shows at AS220? Yeah, we have. I'm going to do one on December 4th. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. Just talk to Bert. I'll be around. Hey, check it. That'd be great. I'd That'd love to cool. have you. It'd be wonderful. It would, my life would be complete. Oh. But, uh, well, now, you were uh, sort of halfway between uh, Nashville and Boston a few years back. Yeah. Do you mind talking just a little bit about Anastasia Screen and what happened with Not that? at all. Go ahead. Well, okay, as far as I remember, you came out with Laughing Down the Limehouse, and I guess it must have been 91. Mm -hmm. That was a brilliant album. And after that... It was a nice piece of fun. Yeah. Well, it, it had, you know... No, I liked it. I liked it. I'm trying to think of what that song was. Um, the one with the samples. The samples? Yeah, it's the first song on side two. Hmm. Is that the, on the second record? Oh, maybe I'm thinking of the second record. Dead in the Grass? Dead in the Grass. Yeah. yeah. That always, that seemed to me to be sort of like a fortunate son or something like that. Yeah. That one kind of summed us up. <laughs> yeah, I felt so much. In a lot of ways. Well, I could be like really obtuse and say, where does this all come from? But I don't really have to ask that because, you know, working in a factory. Having to make a living. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. What, what, there always, there seems to be, though, like a, a sense of, I don't know, something better. It's not totally nihilistic, it's a song like that. It's yeah, well, the whole thing, I never, I, I, I don't get into nihilism, you know. No, I don't believe in it. <laughs> well, why did Anastasia Scream decide to uh, sort of go their separate ways. Mm, I decided I was the first one. Um, we were writing these songs and uh, they just weren't up to par. We did a demo tape and I was going to go back and do vocals and I was listening to it. There just wasn't anything there. We went through a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff personally um, and as a band. And as a band we didn't really mind like dragging around bands that Sang, we called it the angel because it sang and the door was off of it and you know we didn't get a lot of promotion we'd show up at shows even on tours with bigger bands and nobody was promoting it you know it's Dutch East India here and example our last day of our big tour they give us our tour posters <laughs> and you just couldn't read them they were one color they were pink and white and you couldn't read anything because they were highly detailed but it was pink and white what well, was the last day of your big tour? I mean, where was it? Oh, I don't know. This was a New York show with a bigger band throwing music. And um, that, in a way, was maybe our last chance to, you know, get people to know who we were. But there wasn't anyone pushing records behind us when we played, you know. I, I, I can't count the times that I heard, we can't find your record anywhere. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was true everywhere. And, England, Europe, and here. Couldn't find it. No one could find it. No one ever heard it. 
Well, and that got that got kind of old after a while. And perhaps you can console yourself with the fact that <coughs> if you make it big in some future project, people will be frantically scrounging for those records, and they'll be re-released. And I all fucking hope so. They were good records. Like Alex Chilton, Big Star, you know. <laughs> kind of. Okay. Although Big Star, I think, was probably bigger than Alex Chilton. Yeah. So, or uh, I, don't know. I don't know if there are any other examples of, of that syndrome, but. Uh, you know, yeah, there aren't. There aren't that many, but not too many. Yeah, I hope people pick up the records at some point. Like okay, ELO, Jeff Lynn, the birthday party. The van Jeff Lynn was in before ELO. You know. The birthday party. Yeah. I thought yeah. it was the move. He was in that too. Oh, but, the birthday uh, party. That was. No, Jeff Lynn wasn't in the move. Roy Wood was in the move, and he started ELO with Jeff Lynn, who was in the birthday party, oh. and then Jeff. We never get this story straight, but apparently, from what I understand, Jeff sort of pushed Roy out of that band and took it over for his own project. That's what it kind of looked like. Yeah. And Roy came out with like dozens of pretty undistinguished albums. Yeah. Well. Some crazy beard stuff. Talk a little bit about your sidemen and woman. Mm -hmm. Well, there's Judd. Well, I wouldn't call them side persons. They're integral parts of the trio. Yes, yeah, it's a band. It, it didn't really start that way, but they're too good to deny anything but full bandship, you know? Deny anything but full. Was Judd in other bands before Scarce? Yeah, he's played around. Uh, I don't think it's anything anyone had really heard of. Common Thieves here and there. They was got it a little in, bit. Was that in Providence? Um, yeah. How about Poughkeepsie. your bass player? Um, she played in Providence and some in D.C. where she's from. What's her name? What's her name? Mm -hmm. Joyce. Joyce. Raskin. Joyce Raskin. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, should, I should know these things before I sit down to an interview. But the drummer is uh, doing some editing, huh? Is that what you'll be doing? No. Oh, really? <laughs> no editing. <laughs> no nothing. Wow. It'll be a send-off. So who watches this? Who knows? <laughs> I'm going to put it on pause, all you folks out there, all three or five or ten of you who happen to be watching With a Pop-Tart glass of milk and a joint. And we'll be right back. <laughs> well, who should it be? Speak of the devil, and they appear. It's Judd and Joyce, the other two members of Scarce. So, um, Joyce, I hear you're from Washington, D.C. I'm from capital of the world. Oh, did you ever, like, go see those bands down there? Like, yeah. Spies Excuse everywhere? Me. Um, what? You ever see spies everywhere? Spies everywhere. No, it's before my time. Or after. Perhaps. <laughs> what is your time exactly? My time, um, um, passed four years ago. Oh. That's the last time I was in that, hanging around, seeing that music down there. So. What prompted your move to Providence? Um, going to school. Whereabouts? RISD. Oh, well. Studying illustration. That's wonderful. Yeah. Jeez, you know, if I had any talent whatsoever, I think I might do, do that very thing <laughs> myself. Uh, but, but I guess there's always the cooking schools down there. Yeah. You know, if all else fails, I can. <laughs> if all else fails, go to Johnson and Wales. Yeah, or yeah, right. <laughs> well, you make a mean biscotti, so you never know. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Um, so, you know, the, the, this, this rock critic interviewing members of rock band format nearly almost always turns on. When did you first start playing the bass? When I was 14, my brother and my mom and my dad wanted me. They were like, you should play. So were, they, were they musicians? No, but they were always encouraging us to do stuff. My brother played, so he used to play piano, you know, kind of boring. And I never wanted to practice. So my brother was like, play some rock music. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> did you ever, did you listen to a lot of music, <clears throat> music you know, and like sort of want to play like any particular bass player? The jam. Oh, yeah? Bruce that's Boxton. You know, I think That's Entertainment is maybe going to be my favorite song. You know? They're the best band. The demo version, please. Have a donut. Please. <clears throat> 
Jefferson, but Northport is a lot like Port Jefferson. They're both kind of touristy. I have actually cool. been to Port Jefferson, so I know exactly nice. what you mean. Yeah. Northport's a lot smaller, but it's you know just as just as nice. It's beautiful. Yeah. So I grew up there up until I went I went to school up in Poughkeepsie, and then right after I graduated, I moved to Providence and I met these guys. Any particular reason that you chose Providence? Well, I was playing in a band before this, and we. Just kind of chose that we liked a lot of the bands coming out of Providence and Velvet Crush, and we moved there to, to try to get in with them, and we ended up we ended up breaking up, and I started playing with Chick and then Joyce. Well, tell us about that fateful first meeting. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> well, actually, uh, I I had heard about about Chick looking for a band, and uh, I I called him, and then we met like I guess the next morning or that day. I'm not really sure. And I had already been drinking that morning, and we went to meet him at, at a bar, and it, was, it worked out really well. We we all agreed on a lot of things, had a lot in common. Like drinking but, in the morning. Yeah, like <laughs> there. Yeah, I think I dropped it. Oh, you did this too. <laughs> but it worked out. We, you know, it just right away it seemed pretty pretty good. Was this in 1992? Yeah, this was like in uh, October. Yeah, that was. Wow. Yeah, sure. It was, it was a year ago. October. I didn't even know you guys. Yeah, and, and Chick and I were playing for a while and arranging stuff, and just just the two of us for a while, and then we hooked up with Joyce in like February. Well, how did that happen, Joyce? Um, Chick saw me play at a show, and he asked me. Well, actually, yeah, and then I, I was in New York for like a couple months, and he just called me up and said, "Hey, we're looking for a bass player." So, what band were you in? Um, Mr. One Thousand. What was it called? Mr. One Thousand. Mr. 1000? You guys have a single out. Yeah, we have a single out. Well, no. Here we go. Complete discography of Scarce, dude. <laughs> now, you guys have a single out, too. Yeah. Now, what's on it? Uh, Days Like This and uh, Scorpion. Scorpion Tray. Scorpion Tray? Scorpion Tray, yeah. Yeah. I saw it on sale at Tom's Tracks. How much is it selling for? Three bucks. Here. Oh, maybe I should actually break down and <laughs> buy it. Uh, that way I won't have to scrounge a tape off you guys, you know. But you know, you know how you get, you know. It's like, oh, I don't have to buy this. It'll be given to me. Uh, you know, but um, no, I think three bucks is, is That's little fair. enough for a worthy cause such as this. And I think I'll pick it up. Since it, where is it available in the Boston area? I think at one mystery train or... One of those, Where is it available? or like Newberry yeah. Comics, in the US I think they got it. Newberry Comics. Think. Yeah, probably there. Somebody told Newberry. me they saw it there on the, one of those places in your on, ear, on Newberry Street. Well, you absolutely can't go wrong, and that's how the Beatles got their start, you know. Do you have My Bonnie by the Silver Beatles, you know, Brian Epstein? Hmm, they're all asking for this band by the Beatles. Ooh, <laughs> look into this, the Cavern Club. See, so you never know. So, you know. <laughs> Those uh, 10 or 12 of you out there who are watching this, please go to your record store and ask for scarce. Yay. And, well, those are mighty scarce nowadays, so I don't know. <laughs> you, you know, like, you're going to get that sooner or later. Like, the who got it. Who? We'll get who? used to it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I don't know. I guess, I'll, uh, I, guess I had to, t you know, break the ice or something. But, you know, that dopey comment. Who's Julio Julio? Julio Julio? <laughs> Oh, what Julio wants, Julio gets in 1993. I can't see all that. It's a it's a piece of found art, I guess. Uh, I like Julio. I haven't decided what to do with it yet, and 
1993 is almost over. It's a good name. Yeah, sure. Julio. Down by the schoolyard. And, um, <laughs> I wish I had a fish name Julio. <laughs> it's a good name for a fish. Sure. <laughs> I can see that. Well, it seems a bit premature to ask about the early history of the band, but I think I'll We're take a step. Pretty early. Anyway. <laughs> well, this is it. <laughs> what was what were the first What was the first gig you guys played in your current lineup? Babyhead Club, Babyhead, and then Providence. Yeah. What was that? We did a What was it like? March. Uh, March. Yeah, March tenth or something. something. How'd it go over? Great. Good. You guys had, had been like, uh, in, you know, practicing and... For about a week. Yeah, yeah. Joyce had been playing with us for about three rehearsals. Learned seven yeah. songs in one in three days. Yeah, in yeah, one day. Yeah. It was... <laughs> we improved on it. That's hard. People take for granted how hard it is to do this. But, you know, <laughs> try playing an instrument and singing at the same time and you'll discover that if you try it for the first time, it's not as easy as it looks. Far from it. Chick, I believe you have an anecdote about having done that one time. You tried to play that kink song. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. Oh, man, you remember all of this <laughs> old stuff. Yeah, okay, we played, it's my first show ever, ever, ever. And we had to sing You Really Got Me. That was the song I had to sing, and I forgot how to play the guitar for the whole song, so it just hung there in front of me, and I held the mic and sang it. And my voice started cracking, too. <laughs> oh, that must have been embarrassing. It was fun. It was following a song called New Wave Sandwich. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, okay. we were really good. We were hot. I had leather pants for that. <laughs> the other guy wore a Boy Scout uniform. It was great. So you've been together 10 months, and so there haven't really been all that many ups and downs in your career so far. Just when we fight. Mm -hmm. Me and Chick. Chad's always just... But we enjoy that. Well, it's one way to interact. He settles all our disputes. Well, we fight and then we talk. <laughs> well, you know... Very copacetic. For, forgive the uninitiate in these matters, but what do people in bands fight about? They change it. Everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, your, what your face looks like How you practice. write a song. Why you're standing there. <laughs> Anything. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, as you viewers will see if you should tune in on January 4th, the band is very kinetic. It's constantly right. moving about the stage. <laughs> so, I don't know. We got we ate Mexican jumping beans before the show. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you weren't moving around that much, but your face moves. <laughs> you know, and you have this. You have this malevolent he's kind of, grin, which he's kind of is paranoid. so friendly at the same time. He's kind of was paranoid because I always run into him. Yeah, it was very friendly. There was nothing crazed about it, you know? There wasn't? No, not really. I've seen, sometimes I've seen it where you're really, like, mugging, but tonight you were just, like, doing your, you know, your, your facial expressions, and they were great. And the guy who was uh, videotaping was getting a lot of tight close-ups, and it was being broadcast on a big widescreen TV hey. over the bar. Wow. So we were on TV. First time for me. Well, it was closed circuit, but you'll actually be on television. <laughs> I guess it's going to be on TV. <laughs> this will be on television. If you consider that TV. Uh, it weren't for cable access. We couldn't do this. Let's discuss the audience. All right, let's People talk about watching the audience. this. <laughs> okay. What, what time does it air? Well, this uh, segment right here will probably be on at 10.55 p.m. Ah. We're in our last five minutes of the show. Ah, that's, uh, you s uh, that's not too late. That's not too late. It used to be it started at 9.30 and it went in until like 12.15 a.m. And that's a little later. Yeah, I well, was thinking like 3 a.m. kind of thing. I didn't know. Well, someone like Lenny Bruce said, they show all these drunk driving commercials at 2, in the end, 2 a.m. Who's watching it? Drunks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, ah, sit on this baby. You know, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know who watches cable access. I, I like to think of it as people were channel surfing and all of a sudden they hit this. Yeah, it, it like looks it. different. You know, sound bites and, and stuff. Because, you know, the eight second attention span. But there's, there's at least one guy who watches the whole thing. Do I know you think our conversation has been titillating? Though. No, I believe it's been edifying. Oh, 
I don't think any, I don't think any individuals will have their lives ruined as a result of this <laughs> interview. Yeah, I hope not. I sincerely hope as not. As long as they don't go to Knoxville. Well, see, there you are. Well, can you discuss uh, Providence? What, what do you like about Providence? It's a very supportive music scene. Yeah, it's great. People are excellent there about going and supporting bands, even if, like, you know, it's like whatever. Like, it's everybody's like, pretty unique there, I think. It's like a city of Care Bears. <laughs> all the bands are really pretty different. Yeah. But they still all but everybody hang goes out to all the shows. Yeah. They're just cool to each other. And I guess all the bands that have names like Strut and Brat play out in the suburbs. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they don't play. We don't hang out with Strut or Brat. I've never heard of them. We wanted to. But they were there and think we were cool enough. I know. It was bad. Well, I've got, I've got links of my own down there, so I know all about <laughs> these bands. Actually, though, I haven't seen all the premier bands. I think I've seen Small Factory, but I haven't seen Velvet Crush and, you know, all those others, Boss Fuel. Sure. I've heard about them. Excellent. You should go to the Sunday night shows at um, Last Call Saloon. Yeah. Those are always, yeah, those are always consistent. Really good. Yeah. Cheap, fun. Lots of out of town, out of state bands. Yeah. I went to Babyhead during one of their uh, techno nights. Oh, <laughs> big mistake. Well, my sister was in town and she wanted to see some nightlife, and uh, you know how it is. And That's nightlife, I guess. I played pool with a Perot supporter. Yeah, you could, could have gotten nightlife if you'd have turned over a log next to a creek. <laughs> There's some nightlife there, too. Well, for me, it was sort of like a busman's holiday working at a club and whatnot. You know, I didn't really, I, I didn't care. It could have been like, it could have been Bobby Boris Pickett and you know, anything. I wouldn't care. I'm jaded. Burned out. Except, of course, every once in a while a band comes along which like really restores my faith and love of music. Mm -hmm. I would say the paper squares are one of them. Now, would I be going too far if I said that Scarce is another? I, I really like that set. Not if that's the way that you feel. It's the way that I feel. Wow. You guys are in for a real treat, you guys out there watching this, because on January 4th, as I've said for about maybe the fifth time, we will be presenting a concert by Scarce, recorded earlier this very evening, thanks to the miracles of television technology. <laughs> well, for our final minute, I guess we should just do uh, some sort of... Jig. <laughs> What's your favorite scene from your favorite movie, Judd? My favorite scene from my... Start with him, because I'm okay. not ready yet. Jig, what's your favorite scene from your favorite movie? Um, John smoking the cigarette and he goes over the cliff combing his hair. Okay. <laughs> and your favorite scene? I have to say, down by law, where Tom Waits gets kicked out of his house by his girlfriend and he throws out everything and the only thing is, don't, don't throw my shoes. And he's got these beautiful shoes and he sits on the corner. He's like, good shoes. <laughs> Because they're nice shoes. They're shiny. Alright. Well, I think mine is in um, Lost in America when they bet their whole, all their money, their nest egg, on uh, number 22 on the roulette wheel. Of course, they lose. And uh, take it from there. Rebuild. That's my favorite moment. It's kind of a downer, buddy. No, Not really. It's a gooder. It's a gooder. Yeah. They, uh, well, not really, actually. <laughs> I like it. Well, I must say, to end this interview, my favorite scene from my favorite movie is The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, where uh, the old miner says, You darn fools! You're sitting on a mountain of gold and you don't even realize it! <laughs> well, you folks in Boston are sitting on a mountain of gold, and you folks in Providence, too, and they're called scarce, and you don't even realize it, so go see them Aww. soon. This concludes our evening's presentations. And